Hello everyone and welcome to episode 44 of the IWFM Navigating Turbulent Times webinar series. Today's episode is about effective team leadership during hybrid working. And uh, if we move on to the next slide, this is with John Baker. So for many of you, um, you would have seen me host our episodes, uh, our previous episodes. So I'm Peter Brogan, Head of Research and Insight at the IWFM. And like many of our 43 episodes that we've done to date and including this one, we've covered a range of topics right through from COVID-19, right through to return to work, right through to sustainability matters, right through to hybrid working, which is our next week's episode. But today um, we're going to be talking about, um, with John Baker, really about how meetings often fail to engage all people in a room. And that gets worse when those meetings are hybrid meetings, which obviously we're all experiencing at the moment. So today we're going to improve the hybrid meetings you run uh, with, with John's presentation called The Sharks Feed Feed at Sunset, which I find very intriguing because I've got a bit of a, a guilty, guilty um, thing, <laughs> thing about sharks in my own right. Please welcome the author of Running Meetings That Make Things Happen, John Baker, who's a professional speaker and coach and introvert in business. So you can see John up on your screens there. Um, just to let people know before I do hand over to John, today's episode is recorded. So this is live, which I'm proving probably already it's live. Um, we do have a dedicated Q&A session, um, a section at towards the end of today's webinar. Would encourage you to send your questions in throughout. John is a stellar speaker. It's going to be very interactive, so we want you to participate as best you can. But uh, no further ado, I'm taking enough time as it is. I'm going to hand over to you, John, and you will hear from me later. So, John, good afternoon. Hi, Peter. Do you believe that every person in your team and in your meetings is working individually and together as effectively as possible? Now, I think it's an even bigger issue today with many teams not even being in the same location and personal stresses being way higher than ever before. Hybrid working and hybrid meetings create technical and people issues for leadership that we're just not used to dealing with. It's easy, in fact common, to focus on technical elements to fix the problems, but us humans are the root of this. So I want to concentrate there. Now, you're always going to have introverts and extroverts in your business. And I'm sure that you'd agree with me that it's important to engage everybody equally in the best meetings. And in fact, in my opinion, the most effective meetings and the most effective leaders communicate well across that whole range and get the most from everybody, whether face to face, remote or hybrid. So today I'm going to share some ideas that will allow you to do just that. I'm going to focus especially on the introverts because that's where my research lies and it's easiest to disengage them. I want you to be able to give your team the gift of time so they have all the time they need to make the contribution you need with less floundering around. The research, by the way, is based on a survey of 350, 400 business people, both introverts and extroverts, where about a third of people are not fully productive, with communication and culture being the biggest causes, especially among the introverts. And then you go communication and culture, both leadership issues, both things that we can control when we run our meetings. But before we go any further, Hybrid meetings, what do we mean by that? Well, face-to-face -face meetings, I guess we've grown up with. Remote meetings we've got used to over the last year. But hybrid meetings where you've got some people in a room and some people in a Zoom, much harder. And we hear lots of discussion about software, microphones, and even software to report on engagement, which to me sounds a little bit scary. Just before we go any further, though, I just wonder if we could have a couple of quick polls. The first thing I'd love to, to know about is which type of meeting do you find to be the worst? Hybrid, remote or face to face? And so perhaps Pete, you could share that poll with us. That would be brilliant. 
Thanks, John. And that's been shared at the moment. So just to recap, which do you find are the worst? Face-to-face -face meetings, remote meetings, hybrid meetings. Um, so we just give you a, a, a couple of uh, moments to fill that in, mainly, mainly a minute. So please, please, everyone, encourage you to get, get involved today with the polls and, and the questions. So uh, we just share the results in a moment, John. Thank you very much. And just as a, while you're typing your answer to that in, if you've got questions as we go, please share them into the question box. We will have a break for some questions in a few minutes time, and we will have another break for questions before the end. But the more you type in now, the more we can steer what's going on as we go. And that's kind of what I use this poll for, to be honest. I can kind of start to adjust what we're doing. So we've got the results of that. Oh, okay, so a definite hybrid meeting phobia, if I can put it like that. And I think everyone can see that. Perhaps we can jump on to the second poll, which is now about you. Are you an introvert? Are you an extrovert? So if you're a strong introvert, I'd like you to put one. If you're a strong extrovert, five. And somewhere in the middle, two, three or four. It's just interesting to see this spread. And again, it helps me to perhaps adjust some of the content of what we're going to talk about. So again, encourage people to participate, you know, the process from the first poll. So we just give you a few more moments on that and then we close the poll and you see the results, John. I'm looking forward to it. Gets exciting now. OK, so we've got a interesting mix then. So mainly somewhere in the middle, perhaps slightly more introverted than than other. OK, so that's that's really interesting. Thank you for that one. And uh, let's. Let's keep going afterwards. So before diving into a kind of big discussion on introversion and leadership, I want to take you back to a time where I'm wearing heavy black rubber. And no, just in case you're thinking of something a little bit strange, I'm wearing this heavy black rubber because I'm about to do something I love. I'm about to spend time in the water. I'm gripping grimly onto a piece of rope that's attached to a rubber dinghy skimming across the channel. The waves are smashing us in the face. And I look around at my friends and we're all actually quite excited, although on one half of the boat, you've got people jabbering away with their excitement. And on the other half of the boat, you've got some quiet excitement going on, which is perhaps slightly strange. And then the boat slows down. As it slows down, the waves disappear. It stops. One final check. Is everybody okay? And then we roll off back into the water and drop like stones. One, two, three, four, five meters underwater. And now it really is quiet with this quiet excitement that's really focused. Now, I wanna come back to that. So I'm gonna come park that and remember that one and come back to that in a few minutes time because it reminds me of another time. And this discussion of quiet excitement is kind of odd because some people say introverts can't get excited. And the answer is they can. They tend to do it perhaps more quietly. But the time I'm remembering is the first day in my second ever proper job. I walk in across the car park into the reception area and I'm feeling 15 foot tall. Yay, get me. Look how good I am. Nothing but nothing is going to put me down on this day. And I walk up to the reception desk and she's got ready for me. And this is going to sound a bit sad, so I do beg your forgiveness on this one. She gives me my first ever photo ID card. And I'm like, whoa, yes, wearing this photo. Now I feel 20 foot tall, amazing. And just before you think that really is sad, I bet you had a moment like that before now as well. But the next thing happens, she walks across the reception area and I follow her, she opens the door and then it hits me. No, no, not the door. What hits me is a tsunami of noise. It's making me doubt whether I'm up or down. It's making me, every fiber in my body is saying, get out, leave the building now. I realize that's probably not a great career move. I make myself breathe a couple of times and then I'm able to follow her into the office. It turns out that this huge noise is only, only the chatter of the 200 or so people in the open plan office. I follow her across the, the room 
into the team's meeting room where the monthly meeting is about to begin. And there's two or three huddles of people that are standing there engaged in small talk. And I don't know about you, but most introverts hate small talk and I shudder at the thought of it. Although interestingly, I've never really thought about what we would prefer because big talk, well, I've just said huge amounts of noise isn't something we like, small talk we don't like, and medium talk, medium talk doesn't sound quite right either, does it? That sounds a bit like talking to dead people. Perhaps I'm digressing. Because the next thing that happens is the boss walks in and the meeting immediately begins as he hands around a 27 point agenda. 40 years on, yes, I am that old, 40 years on, I remember 27 points and a big thick wadge of paper. Now it's quite clear as I look around the room that nobody else in the room either has seen these agenda items or these reports. And the wadge of paper has got graphs and charts and all sorts of things on. And he kicks off the meeting by saying, and calling somebody out and asking about the first item on the agenda linking to the first report. And they they look down into the report because they've not seen the data before. And he's almost disparaging of them because they, they hesitate for a moment. And then somebody else over in this corner of the room throws out a couple of answers and he praises them. And this kind of goes on all day, this calling out of individuals. And I'm hiding in plain sight or trying to. You know, I'm, no, I'm not there. I'm not there because I don't want to be called out. And I bet you've had sessions like that as well. But the interesting thing was, because I'm brand new, I'm actually looking in the data. There's people that are using the data and they're looking at the data in their answers. He's disparaging. There's people that are answering quickly and he's praising them, yet their answers have got nothing to do with what's in the data. And it didn't take me many months to realize that this was typical for the way he ran his business. And I realized that I'm never going to give my, my best results working in this company. And after 10 months, I'm looking for another job and already quite a few people have left during that time. And so my point is, if you run meetings, if you manage a team without considering the statistically accurate 30 to 50% of your team who are introverts, you will never get the best from your whole team. You'll never maximize your meeting engagement and get full productivity from your business. And in a short survey I've done recently, and in fact, the own poll that we did just now, the worst kind of meetings that we've just said are hybrid meetings. So I want to talk a bit more about this, this introvert thing. But before we do that, I would love you to join in with me for a second. I would like to know how you define an introvert. Now, what I'd like you to do is grab your phone or grab a tablet or open another browser tab. Just don't lose me. And click in menti.com. And then when you've done that, it'll come up with a uh, number for you. And it'll key in 9211. And you should then be able to answer how you define the word introvert. And you can give three or four one word answers. So I'm just going to go silent for a minute so you can put in some answers. How do you define the term introvert? So at menti.com 76139211. Once you've done it, if you could hold that, put that, put that down, we are going to come back to menti.com in a little while as well. Because I've got a couple of questions that I want to use on menti. But for now, how do you define an introvert? And let's see what words we've got coming up there at the moment. Just moving as it kind of sticks a few more on there, actually, which is cool. So biggest one there, the biggest letters, by the way, are the ones which have been said the most times. The smaller ones have only come up once or twice. So quiet, thoughtful. And actually, that's not bad. They're quite good words. So on there, the next biggest one I see is shy, which I'm going to come on to in a moment, is a complete myth. Introverts are not shy. But other interesting ones we've got there, nervous, lacking confidence, withdrawn. And actually, I would say that those are completely wrong, which is quite an interesting thought, isn't it? What I'd 
So you keep on plugging stuff in there if you haven't yet, which would be brilliant. But what I'd like to do is to give you two words. Every time you hear the word introvert, I'd like to think of the word energy and process. Energy first. Energy by which I mean people energy. In other words, what happens when an introvert is among people? Perhaps you remember the old Nokia 3310, who's one of my first mobile phones. You charge it up quietly somewhere, and yet when it comes to talking, the battery will go and disappear. They de-energize, sometimes very quickly, sometimes after an hour or so. Always seemed a bit pointless to me. Introverts tend to be like that. Charge up, charge your energy quietly, and then de-energize when with lots of people. And then the second word I said, process. Don't understand that a bit. Internal processing or external processing. And now let's think of that in, in English, if I can put it like that. By process, think the way you think. An introvert tends to use internal processing. In other words, you ask a question and they will think through the answer and they try and come up with the most complete, the most accurate, the best, well structured answer they can. And then they will speak. Whereas an extrovert will ask the question and words come bouncing straight back. So the extrovert think talks to think. They just fire words back out. It's the way they think. Whereas the introvert thinks to talk. Now, neither of those is good or bad. Neither of them is wrong or right. They're just very different. And the same with the, the energy thing. Neither is good, bad, wrong or right. But what we've got here is two defining points which each explain a lot of the things that go on in meetings and a lot of things in teams, which is why I wanted you to understand them. And you may recognize one or both of them. You might find yourself at one end of the spectrum or quite probably looking at most of you on the poll, you'll find yourself somewhere in the middle. But I'd also like to touch on three myths about introversion. And the first of the myths that I'd like to share with you is that introverts are shy. And the real answer to that is no. Shyness and introversion are two totally separate things. Shy people, and it can vary if you're strongly shy or mildly shy, or you could just be a little bit timid. You could be almost at the other end. You could have social anxiety. They tend not to like speaking in, in groups of people. Introverts, as we said earlier, is about energy and process. Just to make it worse, though, you could have a shy introvert and trying to get them to engage in your meeting is going to require a lot more effort but to mess with your head you could have a shy extrovert and just work out how that happens so you've got somebody who's energized by being with people and won't say anything so shy and extrovert definitely different things altogether this the interesting thing about this one is i can see where the myth might come from because if i'm invited to a meeting and my people energy is already feeling low and I know it's just going to go a bit more, I might try and avoid going to the meeting and that might get interpreted as shy. The second myth then is that introverts are antisocial or standoffish, which sounds a bit weird, but I've spoken to many, many introverts and they often say that this is how they get told they are. Let's think about what's going on. Take the year 1 BC, that's one year before COVID. Do you remember the times when we go to meetings where there might be, I don't know, 100 or so people standing around in a room in, in little huddles of five or six? And I might be in that little huddle and I'll be chatting away with the group and I start to feel my energy dropping. Now, the thing I would most like to do at that point is head for the hills, go home and recharge. Not a good career move. However, what the other thing I can do is step to the back of that little huddle. What have I just done? Literally, I have stood off. But then it gets a bit further than that. Supposing, and this happened to me on Zoom, I think it was last week, there was a group of people chatting away and some of them were just firing words at each other. It was a real extrovert talking to think thing going on. And then after a minute or so, I came back with my more considered, structured answer. I didn't think it was any better or any worse, it was just a different answer. And 
I got told later by a couple of people in that group that I was being a bit snooty or superior. And I kind of unpeeled that a bit with them. And what they told me is because the way it came back afterwards and it was more structured. Well, that doesn't mean that's how I was wanting to be. I certainly didn't want to be. I don't even think my answer was better. It just uh, comes back to this. Do you think internally or externally? Is your answer more structured or not? And let's talk about the third myth for a second, because I think the third myth is possibly the biggest indictment on Western society going, that introverts are not good leaders. And what does this imply? It implies that good leaders are bold and loud and talking all over the place. What on earth has that got to do with leadership? Now, I get that a good leader may sometimes need to, off the cuff, address a group of people, maybe shareholders or a news crew or the staff. And if you've got to do it off the cuff and just instantly reply and perhaps even cut over a number of people to get your view there, introverts might not prefer that way of communication, but they can do it. But surely leadership is far more than just being bold and loud. Let's think about what else is in leadership. What does a good leader to need to do? She needs to have a vision and she needs to inspire staff to drive towards that vision. Nothing about being introverted or extroverted there. And perhaps another one, a good leader needs to be able to run a meeting where everybody contributes. And that might mean she needs to take a back seat and let others take the limelight. And you know what? I would have thought that a introvert could actually be better in that situation than an extrovert. So again, I share this not because I want you to think in one's wrong and one's right, but my basic point is that if we're going to have good meetings, if we're going to get a good team working together, we need to spend time understanding different people's personality preferences. So before I go on too much further, what I'd like to do is just stop for a couple of minutes for questions. And Pete, if you've got any questions, particularly ones that are around the definition of things that we've been talking about, introverts or extroverts, is there anything, any questions that we'd like to, to deal with now? A couple of minutes on questions. Yeah, great. And uh, yeah, I would encourage uh, viewers to to bring some listeners some questions in. So thank you, John, on that. Already some encouraging myth bust in there around introverts. And I'd be quite open to say to the audience, I would classify myself as an introvert. So would an introvert really be doing or hosting a webinar for one, which I've done many episodes really on. So yeah. there, there's there's a point in, in its own right. Um, there is a, a couple of questions coming in about I guess what we're not trying to do is divide people, label people at all from the introvert camp to the extroverts and one's better than the other. But um, have you got any examples there of strong introvert leaders that might resonate yeah. with, 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 with Absolutely. the audience? Yeah. Because, um, Great question. I've, I've heard many and I've read, um, I've read many autobiographies from actors and one's Robert De Niro, which he, he describes himself as one of the shyest people off screen. But oh, when wow. he goes okay. on screen, he is mm. um he goes into almost what you call an extrovert he's acting essentially mm. but i guess to resonate when you talked about leadership and myth busting that an introvert doesn't make necessarily a great leader because they don't shout or raise their voice is there any examples there for the audience yeah. that could resonate with a sure. strong introvert so, leaders a couple of interesting ones so first of all about a year ago i asked about um 160 people who they thought of First name they thought of when I said good leader, and this was a UK centric thing, and 63% of them said Richard Branson. Richard Branson is an introvert. So that one straight away, you know, 63% of people think of him first and he's an introvert. Another one which comes to mind because we're talking about meetings is the leader of a great global company, one that, one that we've all relied on, perhaps too much on, in the last year. And Jeff Bezos, I'm told, is an introvert. And I'm also told that his board meetings start off with using one of the techniques I'm going to share with you later on, which I call write it, where people don't get to speak at the beginning of the meeting. They get to write things down instead. So Jeff Bezos, another one would be somebody that very few of us can do without as well. Bill Gates created Microsoft. And I think we'd have to say another example of a leader. Again, 
introverts. And I can, I can tell you there, John Omar, one of our listener viewers, completely agrees with you because he, he put Bill okay. Gates down on one of the questions. So there you go. We do have a question in from, and, and like many of these, the questions start flying in once we trigger one. Um, <laughs> Might have to um, do some of them later, but yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, um, why, 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 uh, well, just directly to you, John, you'd be pleased to know, it's coming from Lewis around, um, why does John think hybrid meetings score so low? So is there any reasoning that you might put behind the poll today and some of your further re research of why, why is that the case? Great question. Thank you, Lewis. So why, why for me? Well, I can give you hundreds of reasons why face-to-face -face meetings make people cringe. And you go and ask a load of people, you say, go to a meeting. How many people go, yeah, I want to go. And then, and then we talk about remote meetings where we've got used to those over the last year. We're all in Zoom and things are a bit more clunky. And then mix the two together. So you've got some people in a room being able to talk to each other like this and being able to see each other's body language really easy. And you've got other people who might be feel a bit like second class. So you've got some in the room and some in the Zoom. And I think that's why it feels that much harder. And so a bit later on, I'm gonna get into some of the things you might do to get around some of that problem. But I think it's the, the combination of room and Zoom that makes hybrid meetings far worse. So from, from an introvert perspective, um, and a couple of questions, I've sort of frameworked them under one here because they, they, they are coming in about, well, shouldn't we just focus all our attention on the extroverts and just let the introvert sit there nice and quietly in the corner and only speak to them if we have to? Now, I've been quite flippant with that, and that, that's not so necessarily the questions that come in, but what, why, why the focus on the introverts? If we've got the extroverts, are saying like your example from your um, job experience there, where things were being discussed, but the the evidence was being ignored. What, what, why is it so important to to embrace everyone in the meeting? It sounds an obvious thing, but there's been many occasions in in previous roles that I've seen exactly your experience, John. That mm. if anything, the extroverts will dominate the meeting, and the introvert is almost, shall we say, sadly overlooked. Absolutely. And so it leads to what, what the questioner kind of almost uh, said there, which is that, well, if we just want engagement in the meeting, we want people to talk in the meeting, get the extroverts to do more talking. Great. The meeting feels lively. But what's going on, really? You want mm. you want a good meeting is a good discussion. A good discussion is where you've got diverse range of views going on so that the group can learn. And let's be honest, if you're not planning on a discussion, why on earth are you having a meeting? Don't either don't have a meeting or don't have that point on the agenda. You could just record a video or send an email out if you don't want discussion. So first point is why meet? It's because you want a discussion. If you want a discussion, what you're aiming to do is get all of the views in the room. The more views, the stronger and more resilient the answer. And if you just have the views of my louder friends over here, it's probably just gonna head in one direction. And that's not a nice singing song either. So just one more question before we move okay. on, John. Yep. Um, are there any more myths that we should be busting around introverts? I know you focused on three areas there, but is, I know I know we've got an hour today and we're trying to squeeze in more content and questions. But um, does, a question's coming. Is there any more myths that from, from the yeah, top three you shared today? So, is there any more so that think... we should be aware of? I mean, there's others that float around and I do one every single week on a, on a weekly podcast. But one of the other weird ones and some of the reason I pick, pick this one is just because it just comes back to what people think and say. And quite often people say, I'll give you two. People say you, you alluded to it earlier, Pete. You said I'm hosting a, a, pod, a, a webinar, therefore I can't be an introvert. Well, that genuinely is one of the myths. People think that, that speakers can't be introverts. People also say, and I've been told, John, you cannot be an introvert because you like bright colours. You might not have noticed it, but I wear often wear bright. You wondered what I was going to do then, didn't you? You. Um, oh, I was getting the worried for a bit, wear... John, but I hope everyone's seen your orange T-shirt. I've been informed, but there you go. Abs absolutely. So, so I can't be an introvert apparently because I wear bright colours. I mean, it's nonsense. So, some weird myths mm. as well. But perhaps, perhaps we'll come back to some more questions later, if that's all right, Pete. 
That's fine. So thank you for that, John. Again, viewers, please, okay. we haven't answered all the questions. You'd be pleased to know, John, but we'll encourage people to still keep sending in their questions and I'll be back later for, for further questions and uh, answers, hopefully, more importantly. So thanks, John. Brilliant. Thank you. So I'm challenging you guys to think differently, to think differently about how you communicate. So the introverts in the team are more comfortable engaging in your meetings because it's, if they feel uncomfortable, they're not really going to engage. Here's a thought for you. Have you ever tried to talk with your head under the bath water? It, it doesn't work too well. Underwater is not the most common and convenient place to have a conversation. And yet sometimes we have to have quiet, effective communication. I'm going to come back to that dive. You remember, we left me five meters under the water. And we've just begun the dive five meters under and the next thing we have to do is critical because if we get it wrong it can be fatal are you okay i'm okay are there any bubbles coming out of my equipment is the computer working is my compass working all is good let's carry on down all hand signals and on this particular day we dropped down the rope it's a blue rope i don't know why it often seems to be blue but digress 20 meters under the water so we've dropped down by another 15 meters and i'm saying stop hold at this level for a second my ear is hurting just waited a minute it's okay now we can carry on down then we dropped another 15 meters so now we're 35 meters under the seabed get to the end of the line and look around again before we leave that rope okay Get the compass out, check. Yes, that's the direction we're heading in. Have you ever noticed that the more relaxed you are, sometimes the more you see? The really weird thing now is we're swimming over a piece of boring sand and we start to see things hiding in plain sight. Floundering around down there are perhaps these, the introverts of the, the undersea world. Introverts have become accustomed to working in places where success is defined in extroverted ways. That doesn't mean that that's where they're best suited and that's their best ways of working, but it does mean that some of them disguise some of their introvert pieces. They adopt other tactics just so they get heard in meetings, just so they get promoted because they hide their introversion. And I'm asking you to communicate differently with introverts Therefore, you need to be able to spot them hiding in plain sight. So I'm just going to go through a few pieces which individually don't give you a clue of anything. But collectively, these might give you some signals. Ah, I've got an introvert in my team or in my meeting. Are they inconsistent socializers? That might be one day, yeah, party. Another day, no, it's the last thing. And it comes down to people energy. If they spent a lot of time with people, they could be inconsistent socializers. Are they more sociable with people that they know? Again, classic introvert piece here. Introverts will do socialize and very happily, but much more so with people that they, they know. You remember earlier I talked about that room. Are they the ones that quite often might be on the edges of the room? Might just come down to that people energy we mentioned. I well, know I mentioned this one earlier. Do they think to talk? Ask the question in the meeting. And the implication of this is that there will be gaps in the conversation. Only slightly, not, they're not stupid or slow, but they're just thinking differently. And the implication of that is introverts tend to be happy with gaps in the conversation. So if you're talking to somebody who doesn't mind a slight gap in the conversation, again, it might be that they're introverted because extroverts tend to be the other way around. They don't like them. In fact, give them a gap there and they'll fill it with words. So again, just another little sign. And the final one I want to touch on is, do they prefer email to phone? And this one again comes back to the processing piece. If you send them an email, or send me one, I can park it to one side, I can deal with it when I finish concentrating in detail on what I'm doing. And then I can pull up the email and process internally without thinking I've got to give a quick answer. Whereas on a phone, first of all, I'm thinking I've got to give a quick answer. And secondly, 
I'm also I'm searching around for nonverbal cues. Introverts tend to listen very well, but also pick up nonverbals. And of course, on the phone, that's much much harder. So introverts tend to prefer the email to the phone. So if you want to to do that, so email where possible. And of course, even worse is when you turn up on their desk and just plonk yourself down there. Although you've got the non-verbal cues, you've got suddenly a real interruption. Oh, I've got to got to deal with things. So my point is that introverts, I haven't defined them, I haven't given you an exhaustive list, but they tend to hide in plain sight. And if you want to get the most out of the introverts in your team, you need to be able to draw them out and you need to be able to communicate differently with them. But if I'm imploring you to change the way you do things, which I am, I'm imploring you to communicate differently with introverts in your meetings so that you can engage them more. I'm going to ask you why. And that's a fairly obvious question. I'm going to answer some of it. In fact, we, we touched on some of it just now, thanks to a couple of the questions. Why? Because as a collective, our meetings will be better when everybody provides some answers, because in that way, we're going to have a more discussed situation. It's not based on one or two views from my friends over here. It's based on the whole collective. It might sometimes be slightly more painful, but we'll get a much better result. Also, though, that's the together piece. If you engage the introverts, you're getting more from them individually as well. So I'd like to stop again and I'd like to jump back to Mentimeter, which hopefully you can still do. And I'd like you to answer another question for me. What do you think the strengths of an introvert are? So I'd just like to spend a second there to go, go back to menti.com and just key in some one word answers. What do you think are the strengths of an introvert? Just give that a second and then start to see what kind of things are coming up. So some of the ones already bouncing up there, and again, the big words are the, the, the ones that are more common, thoughtful, considered, reflective, good at listening. So some, some good pieces up there. I'm going to leave that up there for a moment, just in case anyone else bungs some more words in. But I'm going to give you what I keep coming back to the biggest strengths of introverts and how you might use them and why you might be interested. Introverts tend to be very good listeners. So how might you use that in a meeting? You know how a meeting can sometimes go off track and you want to, a good way of keeping it back on track is to stop it, to summarize what's been said, and then you can head off in the direction you want to. People often say they haven't been heard in a meeting. So again, to stop every few minutes, summarize the discussion, and then move on. Because introverts listen well, they tend to summarize well. So how about this? Rather than you thinking, oh, I've got to keep summarizing, I'm running my meeting. You preset it up with a couple of the introverts in your team, and you get them to summarize periodically. You ask them for that summary, and you'll find that really just two things. One is it improves the meeting, and two is it brings the introverts into the meeting. Because once they start to think their views are wanted and useful, they will start to engage more. The second thing, which is an extension of that, is introverts tend to be very good facilitators. Because they listen, because they summarise, they tend to be good at running the meetings. And here's a thought for you. When you're the team leader, you're running your meeting, you're having to do two things at once. And obviously some of us can't multitask very well but you're having to manage the process of the meeting and you're having to manage the concentrate on the content. How about engaging with prior notice one of the introverts to run the meeting for you? Now you just focus on the content and you're drawing that introvert in and they tend to be good at running meetings. Introverts also tend to think differently. So again, why would we want them engaging in the meeting? because we're going to use different ways of thinking. We're going to get different thoughts coming in there. Introverts tend to challenge, which is a bit odd when we think introverts are shy, but they're not. Introverts tend to be good at challenging. They challenge in a positive way. Rather than being, oi, no, I don't think that, it tends to be a summary of good and bad, and then comes your challenge. And finally, introverts are known for being good at detail. So there's some of the reasons why you might think about engaging the introverts into your meetings more. 
So I want to touch on some of the things you could do in order to do this. Tip number one is what I call zip it. And that is probably the hardest thing for the extroverts to do, but we all need to do it. It comes back to our old friend, the processing gap. Ask a question, there's a little bit of a gap, and then comes the answer. But what tends to happen quite often, the extrovert will jump in and start to answer the question for you. How off-putting is that? Because what you're doing is you're training me that you don't want my answer. In fact, I used to have this regularly with a friend of mine. I was the franchise manager for the north of the UK in for the south. We didn't see each other before the days of Zoom. Once a week or so, he'd ring me up. Hi, John, how are you doing? Haven't seen you for ages. Just wanted to see how you are. So how are you? Yeah, I'm okay, thanks. I, and then there comes that little gap where I think about how I am. And immediately, oh, it's brilliant, so pleased you're all right. I've had a great week. I met the mayor, five of my franchisees have won awards and an outcome this list. Half of which, from, by the way, was from the week before. But anyway, I rang up to see how you are. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. I, um, and he'd jump in again and he'd repeat the same lot again. So. That's why I say zip it, because what had he trained me? He had trained me, I wasn't required to answer. Therefore, in future, I don't bother answering. And if you do that in meetings, you see it happening to people in meetings, they are not going to bother engaging. Introverts, by the way, there's a quick, simple one. If you find this with people, I didn't know it back then. This was about 15 years ago. What I, what I know now is there's a great way of pushing them back for a minute and allowing yourself space to think. What I could have said at the time was, yeah, I'm OK, thanks. I have found two great things happened in last week which you really need to know about. Now, that's just an answer I can memorise. So I don't have to think about that. I can throw that back out. But straight away, there's two great things you ought to know about. Oh, you just pushed him back. So give yourself a form of words or just, just something like that that works to hold people back and give you a moment to think. But zip it. First tactic, we need to learn not to jump in and answer people's questions for them. Now, you remember I was swimming across the ocean bed, sandy and boring, because the next thing that happened was, was actually rather weird. About 20 metres over there, I see four lionfish lying on the seabed and he's swimming up towards a diver who's got his arm outstretched like this and he's wiggling his fingers. Let me tell you about lionfish. They are... They're like the drag queens of the undersea world. They're covered all over in, in feathers, which can be different, or they look like feathers. In fact, I think I've got a, there we go, photo of a, of a lionfish. And this guy was lying on the floor, attracting these four lionfish. Each time he wiggled his fingers, they stopped and they looked interestedly. Each time he stopped wiggling his fingers, they crept in a bit further. And this is all very well, apart from the fact that Anne and I, who looked at each other very worriedly, know something about lionfish that he clearly didn't. Those tendrils is how they get to paralyse their prey, their contact poison. So we're like, hold back. And we can't shout, but we're making as much noise as we can. Back, hold back. And we swam manically over the 20 metres to try and get him to get out of the way so that he could be saved in inverted commas. And why do I say that? Because first of all, it's a completely crazy dive and this guy didn't know that these things were poisonous. Now, I'm not going to claim that some of the people in your meetings are poisonous, but virtually every leader I've ever spoken to about meetings says to me, there's two or three people in the meeting that never ever shut up and there's two or three that never speak up. And it sounds really obvious to say it, but sorry, you've got to hold back some of the louder voices. And there's a variety of ways you can do that. One of them might literally just be to throw out a question and say to the whole team, I want you to answer. I want an answer from each person, but it's going to be limited to 30 seconds or a minute. Start with the more talkative ones. That way you're giving the internal processes longer to think and they work round to them, but keep it to the 30 seconds or a minute that you've told them they're going to get so that they know and they are okay with that. But the, the key point to that then is to hold back some of the others in whatever way you can. I want to think a bit more though. What is going wrong in meetings? 
particularly hybrid meetings. I'd like to jump back to Menti again. I'd like you to tell me, because I've done a survey, but I'd like to increase the value of my survey and I'd like to make this very relevant to you. What do you think is going wrong in meetings? If you could go back to menti.com, that'd be brilliant. And just give that a moment and start to see what you think is going wrong in meetings, particularly hybrid meetings. So I'm just going to leave that for a second so you can go back to Menti and go, here we are, here's some of the things that are going wrong in some of the hybrid meetings. And maybe we can jump on and see what's going on there. What have we got going on here? Oh, whoa, sorry, I've gone the wrong way and I picked up the wrong slide, clearly. Let's just try and fix that one. Here we go, worst meeting issues. It's gone wrong, it's gone completely crazy. So if I can get that back for a half. Okay, here we go. So some of the answers here. And again, this tends to mirror the survey that I've done, where the big things that come up are people being ignored in meetings. People don't like being ignored in meetings. People being over-talked. So one person's talking and somebody starts talking instead. The long ramble, off topic normally, when stuff is irrelevant. So those are the biggest things that go wrong in the meetings. What can you do about them? First thing I'm going to say is that some of it really does come down to you, the person running the meeting. Now, we had the great question earlier about why hybrid meetings are worse. And let's talk about the first of those, ignored. We hate it in a face-to-face -face meeting where we think we've been ignored. One of the things you can do is, especially if the person's just said something, if you just immediately jump on to somebody else, okay, Fred, what's your answer? That person can feel they've been ignored. Rather than do that, summarize what they've said. Again, use one of the introverts or do it yourself. Summarize what they've said. Now, it's much harder to feel you've been ignored because your words have just been summarized and played back to you. And it's even more important when it comes to a hybrid meeting because in the room, we've got people talking to each other, and on the Zoom, out there, it's much harder to hear what's going on. So summarizing what's been said is going to prevent some of that ignored feeling. Point number two that we talked about is over-talking. I'm afraid this really is just gonna come down to your facilitation skills, knowing that it's one of the things that people hate. Okay, Fred, can I just come back to you in a moment? Can I just let Alan speak up first, please? And that's important whether you're face-to-face -face or on Zoom, or even worse, both. Think about how it goes when you're in a hybrid meeting. You've got a group of people who can mutter away to each other at the speed of conversation and just rib scribble out to each other. And then the poor person out in the Zoom feels like a second-class citizen and they easily get over-talked. So again, what can we do? How about having two people to help run the meeting? The first one runs the whole meeting in much the normal way. The second one, focus on the screen. Just focus on the 30, 10, however many people you've got remotely. And their role is to make sure that their points get heard. Make sure that when they stick their hand up, they get heard or call out the things that they put in the chat box, but manage and in conjunction with the second person so that the main person can focus on the overall meeting and the people in the room. One person to focus on the people in the Zoom. It can really help to reduce the over-talking. The long ramble, and sometimes this has just got to be, you just sort of stop somebody and say, can I just stop and summarize the main things you've spoken about, pick out the two or three things that are relevant to what they've said and the subject, and then move on. But the more you let the long ramble go on, the more other people feel frustrated and it builds up like a volcano. And then they want to have their long ramble too. So you really do need to cut that one fairly short. So a couple of thoughts on how you can deal with some of the things that go wrong in meetings. And we'll pick up some more of those in questions a bit later on. I want to go back to very quickly to, to the dive. Because we got past the, the lionfish, 
and we got to the objective of the dive. I'm now at Shark Point, where these beautiful creatures are swimming around. Sorry, Pete, I know you, you have a thing about them, but they're swimming around and they are stunning. They've got evil, malevolent eyes though. And as they go past, you can see these eyes and we are mesmerized. As divers, you're very much aware that you've been given a gift of time. We carry it around on our back, we call it air. You get that one wrong and it's not good. Being mesmerized, I almost forgot. And suddenly I'm waving at Anne, 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 Anne. I'm out of air, I need to go up now. Now the original plan, we went back to the island, swam around to the island, get to the boat. So instead of that, we just went straight up. Not a problem. I get to the surface of the water, I take out my rig out of my mouth and I know I've been given the gift of time and it's beautiful. It was really, really good. Now, why am I talking about the gift of time? Because one of the biggest things that you can do to make your meetings work well is the gift of time. How does it work? Well, we've given a couple of examples so far, but the main thing, you know, ever since you've been to meetings, ever since you had your first proper training session in any way, people said to you, get the agenda out early. And nobody ever does. Now I've given you some reasons. If you want to engage the internal processors, if you want the people that are introverted to engage in the meeting, especially if they're, they're remote and you're in the office with two or three other people, you've got to let them think about it first to get the agenda and the data out a week early. And what's more, if you do that, even some of the extroverts will read some more of the detail and you'll get a much richer, more powerful discussion. So give the gift of time to the people in your team and you will get better meetings as a result. Now, interestingly, what then happened is I could see the boat on the surface of the water. It's quite a way away. We've come up in the wrong place. And I can see behind me this beautiful sunset. Start swimming back towards the boat. It's not a problem. Just swim. Except the current is pushing us back. The current's quite hard. And so you swim five metres one way and we get pushed back two or three another way. And so you start to get more and more tired. And I don't know about you, but when I get tired, I get a little bit tetchy. And we all react to things differently. And I just want to shut up and focus on what I'm doing. So I just want to focus on swimming. Anne, however, is with me. And she's obviously affected differently. John, John, the this, this current's strong. John, John, the people on the boat can't see us. John, John, we're waving and they can't see us because they're staring into the sun. John, John, the sun's setting. John, John, we've seen the sharks. And then came this moment that I'll never forget. John, we've just been to swim with the sharks. The sun setting and the sharks feed at sunset. Now, it was a moment that made me go, oh, and among other things, actually, but it really made me question myself and what I was doing there. And I think it might be a great moment to throw open for some more questions. Pete, have you got some more questions for us? We have, John, we have got, and um, I'm just, I was just expecting the Jaws theme tune to be coming through <laughs> at the moment, <laughs> a tiny of my, uh, no, fear, or, my fear or uh, respect for sharks, but I, I won't bore our audience where that comes from, probably from a child that watched Jaws too many times as a kid, possibly is my reasons for that. Um, so we've got a load of questions coming in, John, so we're probably into the uh, final fur furlong to use a horse in analogy yeah. in terms of today's webinar. Um, a great pres um, presentation today is a lot of comments coming through, so you'd be pleased to know, John, on that. Um, but we've got a question here, and it might be a bit of a myth buster, but it's coming from one, so thank you for that. Do you think introverts are good in adapting? So obviously through, through uh, as you called it, 1BC and uh, now through the pandemic, actually this word about uh, the power is about um, adapting. Is, is there any link there with introverts, extroverts um, that when it comes to I'm adapting sure, I'm sure to the change? reality is that we, we, can, we can all, we might not all always adapt, but we can all adapt. I don't, I don't see that introverts are more adaptive or less adaptive than extroverts. I can give you some reasons why one is better than the other in, in adapting, but I think the answer is no. Okay, great. Um, 
moving down and apologies i'm switching screens just to see the questions coming if anyone wondering what i'm doing a great Not question yourself. came in from Ke kelly <laughs> apparently i can do it um a great question in from kelly is um you talked about maybe uh, john from today's presentation about extroverts changing their behavior sorry introverts but how about in how uh, introvert should just speak up but should the extroverts be adjusting their behavior so without the onus being on the introvert should the extrovert be looking at themselves rather than be putting the emphasis kelly? on the introvert to change kelly i really like you thank you because my big thing is that everywhere in society we just seem to think it's the introvert to do all the work and i don't think it is I really don't. I gave you that example because there are more introverts than slightly more introverts in, on the call today than normal. But generally, I would say it's for the leaders and for the extroverts to adapt. We've all got to, here's the real point, we've all got to learn to work together, learn about communicating with each other more effectively. And that means we've all got to learn how to change things. And for, as leaders, we've got to help people to work differently in our meeting to make our meeting better. I mean, as I said earlier, I could talk about technical stuff for ages, but fundamentally we are humans. And if you want better meetings, as the person running the meeting, you've got to understand more about the communication issues that go on. And that probably means facilitating the meeting, some tricks to help you there. And that quite often means, as we said, shutting those ones up to allow those ones to speak more. But I totally agree with you, Kelly. No, we've got a load of questions and I'm aware of time, John, but I'm, I'm, I guess yep. we're getting up to the point of your last point around I the sun. Another minute or so afterwards. So how, how about yep. two more questions? Two more questions. There you go. We're, how kind of you, John. Uh, as we go down, um, what's the most strangest myth you've heard about introverts in, in your time? So we've talked about myths quite a lot, but what, what's the strangest one that you've come across in your experience? I think, I think that orange shirt one is the, the, the weirdest one, to be completely honest with you, Pete, where people just think that if you're doing loud in inverted commas, whether that's loud physically or loud verbally things, you can't be an introvert. Well, I don't think it's true at all. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think yeah, that sometimes never judge a book by its cover springs to mind on that one. Um, Very true. Now I've got um, a couple, I'm trying to put them into one, which I'm trying to do on this. Uh, let's have a look. Okay, um, we've got a question here um, from, from Liam. Um, going back to your second job, and this is probably talking about workplace design and it's something we're actually tackling next week in terms of hybrid working on our next mm -hmm. episode of NTT but John what's your views on open plan and the opportunity of better workplace designs due to COVID so you described it as that you were welcomed you got your badge these doors flew wide open and you were just welcomed by this noise so I'm yeah, assuming it might be it. yeah yeah hit by hit by the, the, the chat in the open plan office and and I say this next bit because Liam, you're absolutely right. Lots of introverts do really, really struggle with the noise in open plan offices. And so I would encourage you, and I can talk about this one for ages. We can't all go back to the days when we're in little offices of our own, but think more about soundproofing, think more about breaking things out, think more about ways of managing it. Yeah, because um, there is a lot of workplace design you can do to help with that. Okay, as promised, gone through the two questions. We have got more William, in, but I am, I've got an eye on the time. Okay. But I'm intrigued now that it's sunset and the sharks are potentially <laughs> circling, John. So let's so, find so out. What happened more. next? Yeah, absolutely. So what happened next was was actually relatively simple, but I say it because it's got an interesting and useful moral for us. When you want to change things, you have to keep going. I had to keep going to that boat even though I was getting more and more tired because to stop just meant I was going to drift back into the sunset and probably get eaten but the next thing is it was no good changing direction I need to get to the boat I couldn't go turn left or right I had to keep going and again I see so many team leaders try something in the meeting and the next week oh it didn't work and try something different they keep changing direction keep going because the next thing that I did was rather, I just kept going, but rather than completely change direction, 
rather than aiming straight at the boat, took one or two degrees off. By that one or two degrees, it's fairly consistent in direction, but the current wasn't hitting us quite as hard and a gap opened up between us and the sun. They could see us, they came and picked us up and it was that straightforward. So thinking about your team, don't change direction, do keep going, but just one or two degrees slight course variation. Because as I conclude, I want to think about your meetings. You're always going to have introverts and extroverts in your meetings. One of the biggest issues in meetings is groupthink, where everybody thinks in the same way. And if your team is metaphorically staring into the sun, you can help them by shifting the angle very slightly. The biggest benefit from any team comes from a diverse range of views, where that diversity leads to a more resilient and long lasting answer. And as a leader, what does that mean for you? Introverts and extroverts are absolutely essential in a good, balanced meeting. Your role is to ensure all of that talent gets used. And we agreed at the beginning that as a leader, influencing your team is critical. You want them to be more effective in their meetings and individually. I've been talking about ways to do that, focused on how introverts are often disengaged or don't always get engaged. And there's two things I'd like you to consider. One, be aware of the difference, introvert and extrovert. And two, give the gift of time to introverts. Because if you do these two things, I guarantee you will engage introvert, extrovert, and everybody in between, improve your hybrid meetings and become a better leader as a result. Now, at the very beginning, I said I might ask you to join in some of that research. If you go to my website there, there's a question there that says, research and if you click on that oh, there's a couple of minutes there's also as i alluded to as i walk through the discussion some downloads that you can grab on communications and you can even grab a copy of my book running meetings that make people that make people make things happen so opportunity if you go to the website but guys i hope that's been a great help to you thank you peter Hello, Peter's gone. Sorry, I was on mute. Schoolboy error. Ah, that's all right there. there you go. It does it happen. It's not just me, it happens too. Yeah. No, the there you go. We still do it. I was just going to say thank you very much, John, on that in terms of um, further information where people can find out your, your stellar work building on today's webinar, which no doubt on our post survey will indicate that this could have gone on for longer, but I'm aware of time. Um, just a quick question uh, and possibly a quick answer, possibly, is we, we, we had a poll where people were in between introvert and extrovert. Is there any yeah. tips on any... Uh, profiles that would help a team leader really identify the makeup of their team so i'm thinking we've done an episode on disc and i appreciate uh vic o'farrell's on today's webinar who kindly did Hi, that for us. but is there any any particular um profile or system that would help a leader really identify um, that further i mean there's lots of ways and i can give you i can give you well, i mean we we dealt with a few few ideas while we were talking in fact I'm told that 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 um, the little fish thing that we talked about earlier, the signs of introversion, came out on my on my blog this morning on my website or on LinkedIn. It's, it's on my LinkedIn today because I know a number of people commented on it purely by chance. It happens, but um, yeah, use something like that just to, just to start considering: do people leave those little gaps in the conversation? Do they talk to think or think to talk? Because sometimes. We don't, my belief is we can go miles deep and understand something in great, great detail and come up with a 25 different types of people in the world. And it can be really complicated, but by getting a few simple bits right, just considering introvert and extrovert in simple steps, we can make a huge difference. And I, I, like, I like the 80-20 rule. And if I can do 20% of the work and get 80% of the benefit, I'm in for that, which is why I like to focus Great. on the simple version. 
No, so thank you, thank you, John. The audience, you saw where you can find out about, about John's stellar work, as I've mentioned, or you didn't hear because I was on mute. But please, um, please refer to John. This presentation will be um, sent out afterwards. As I say, the live recording will be up on the website shortly. So please look out for that. So John, just lastly, a massive thank you for you today for your presentation. Obviously, your storytelling, obviously your work, including the interactive polls today that fed into the topic and debate. So thank you again. So audience, I've just got a couple of closing slides to go through, which many of our uh, frequent listener viewers will be aware of. Today's episode will be housed on uh, this Insight Hub. So episode 44, which this was, will be housed on the, the website shortly. But we also have information around dedicated content hubs linked to sustainability in particular, as well as our partnership work, research reports, good practice guides and guidance nights, and lots more, as I say, including today's episode so please look out for that also as linked to navigating turbulent times we have a COVID-19 resource page this is regularly updated so please look out for updates on that as we now shift uh, to return into work or as many said we never actually left work also um, as announced last week we, we've launched our conference and on a the positive theme it's about emerging stronger I uh, yes I'm going to use the word hybrid again hybrid in the sense that it is virtual and physical so we have got physical it's selling already so that's good two keynote speakers have been announced already and then uh, the program the rest of the speakers i should say will be announced shortly so please look out for that but would encourage you to book book as early as you can so would uh, look forward for you joining us there on the 13th of september before you know it'll be it, it will be upon us so I just want to say thank you to John again for a stellar episode. Again, we could have gone for another hour. I'm aware that of time factors we couldn't. With the questions that we couldn't answer, I will pass on to John um, to answer. Obviously, John, John is contactable through his contacts, also on LinkedIn. As I said, that's what it's there for. So please, please reach out to John if you wish. Um, and lastly, viewers, I appreciate you joining us for the hour, six minutes as it is now, uh, to take your time out of joining this live episode. Hopefully, you've got some great insights insight around the mix of introverts, how to hold meetings, how to get to know your people. And at the end of the day, it's ensuring that we try and be productive and happy at the same time. If we can always get that balance, it's going to be a much better world, in my humble opinion. And also, I love the shark story as well, John, which did give me a bit of fear at certain points in today's episode. Um, so as mentioned, there is a post survey. Please fill that in. Again, it helps with um, not only rating today's episode, but more important, what you would like to see in the rest of our series that helps us shape the program we have acted we have listened to our members non-members that have joined us today so please um please fill that in because it does really help and that's it again next week's episode will be announced on friday as normal i can tell you about a spoiler alert it's about hybrid working so there's a nice link to today's episode into that episode number 45 um but again, lastly, thank you for joining us. Take care and hope to see you soon on the next IWFM NTT episode. So take care, everyone. Thank you.